is one that revolves around conversations. So to explore how artists engage with historians and historical research on the one hand, while also turning to creativity and imagination to circumvent the limitations of say producing an academic text. Uh, joining me this evening are four distinguished artists and uh, who create work across uh, different art forms from film to theater to the visual arts. So I expect this to be a very rich conversation. Our panelists are Pedro Palma, Ahmad Fua Osman, Luis Frasia, and Kidlat Tahimik. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of them in turn. Pedro Palma is a documentary filmmaker currently based in Portugal. So from an early age, he has shown an interest in cinema and photography. He then uh, went on to complete a degree in the visual arts and later cinema. Today, he act his activity embraces directing, editing, screenwriting in fiction movies, documentary, TV commercials, and many others. In 2017, he completed Henry of Malacca, a Malay and Magellan. And this is the documentary film that is of interest to us here because it centers around the complex relationship between Magellan and Enrique de Malacca to explore a significant historical moment of cross-cultural encounter. Uh, our second panelist is Ahmad Fuad Osman. He's a visual artist uh, from Malaysia. He is one of the founding members of the Matahati Arts Collective in the 1990s. As such, social political themes uh, such as identity politics, the abuse of power and historical amnesia have long been key concern in the conceptual work of Ahmad Fua Osman. Uh, and this encompassed print, video, sculpture, and installation. Drawing on historical accounts, texts, and archive, uh, Fuad uh, also uh, has a penchant for piecing together fragments of evidence and conflicting narratives to open up possibilities for contesting and rewriting established uh, ways of thinking about history. So Enrique de Malacca Memorial Project uh, is an outcome in this direction. It is an ambitious and playful exploration of re the representations of Enrique through the staging of a museum display that uh, troubles between uh, both the truth and imagination that troubles our understanding of the topic uh, between truth and imagination. Uh, Louis uh, Francia uh, uh, is our next panelist. He is a poet, journalist, and adjunct professor. Uh, 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 he's on the faculty of New York University's Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. He's also an online columnist, uh, columnist for the Philippine Daily Inquirer. Inquirer. Uh, he is the author of, among other books, the travel memoir, Eye of the Fish, A Personal Archipelago, Re, a collection of essays, and his most recent poetry collection, Tattered Boat. Black Henry, uh, Frasia's second full-length play, is of concern to us here. It is a play that explores the profound consequences of a clash of cultures when in 1521, Ferdinand Magellan and three Spanish ships make landfall in the Philippines. Uh, Black Henry emphasizes Enrique's role as the go-between of the conquistadors and the islanders. This is a dimension of Enrique that I hope we will have time to discuss further uh, later in our uh, panel. Finally, we have uh, Kidlat Tahimik, who comes from Baguio City, Philippines. Kidlat needs very little introduction he is an artist of many disciplines and a creative force in his community. His work ranges from film, photography, to weaving, freestyle architecture, and carved installations. Kidlat is an enthusiastic advocate of indigenous cultures. His unconventional artworks have also raised awareness about environmental issues. So Enrique of Malacca uh, features as the slave protagonist of his film, Balik Bayan number no. one. The film builds on an earlier attempt to create a feature about Enrique de Malacca in 1979. Uh, this was not completed. Uh, Kidlat returned to the project uh, after, an, uh, after nearly 30 years. 
but soon realized the need to expand the narrative uh, to include uh, uh, the present day. So the search for Enrique, uh, who has over time become a mythical figure, uh, therefore now becomes a way of stock taking the current situation in the Philippines as well. Uh, so despite the diversity of medium and uh, approach, as well as uh, how they have um, explored the figure of Enrique de Malaca. Our panelists have in common uh, this interest in exploring the different representations of Enrique de Malaca in their respective artistic practices. So today, our panelists will be in conversation with one another, but also with our audience to dwell on this topic. Uh, so in the ensuing panel, we will explore uh, the motivation the creative process and the impact of their work. Uh, ultimately, we hope to come away with a better understanding of what can artists contribute to an exploration of history. So while we have a, st a structure for, uh, of proceeding in mind, while we have a structure of proceeding in mind, we also want this panel to be a bit more livelier, uh, to be more of a discussion. So at any point, if you feel, if you have any questions or comments you would like to direct to our panelists, feel free to type the question out in the chat box in the Zoom meeting room, as well as on Facebook and YouTube live stream chat boxes. For those joining us in the Zoom meeting room, you have the extra advantage. Uh, if you prefer to speak, you can indicate this preference in the chat box or by simply raising your virtual hand, okay? So uh, with that, uh, let's uh, begin our conversation. Welcome, uh, uh, panelists. Uh, so uh, maybe, uh, you know, running this on Zoom, the easiest way is to, uh, you know, pass the mic on to the next person. So I have in mind a sequence. We can begin with uh, Pedro, followed by Fua, and then uh, Luis, and, and finally Kidlat. Uh, so uh, to start off with, I want to get a sense uh, from our fellow panelists. How did you first come across Enrique de Milaca? What sparked your interest in him? Uh, I wonder if you could take us on a journey of your discovery. Uh, oh, uh, uh, thank you very much. First, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank this uh, invitation by Contacts and Continuities. Uh, it's an honor to be present with this panel. Uh, some already know, like Kidlet from, from two years ago in Lisbon. So um, I'm Pedro Palma. I'm the film director of the documentary, uh, Henry of Malacca, a Malay and Magellan. Um, this is, uh, for me, this is a project that um, happened on a very special uh, occasion. Happened on the, the night of Christmas, Christmas night of 2015. I was at the friend's house, um, a Portuguese from Malacca, uh, and uh, inside the room belong him and his family. Also, it was the former uh, uh, chief minister of Malacca, uh, Ali Rustam. So we're starting to talk about the connection between Portugal, Malacca, the culture, the heritage. Um, and then the topic about Magellan and the area of Malacca came to the, to the, to the meeting. And, um, and uh, suddenly, Tansri, the, the former chief minister of the, the, the Malacca, he showed interest in producing a documentary about this, this culture, the area of Malacca, uh, a Malay, supposed to be a, a, a Malay. So uh, then we started the process of um, building the project. But actually happened on the Christmas night, 2015, I spent the night the, the Christmas and the New Year in Malaysia, like many times uh, uh, before. So this is the first contact happened uh, at, at that night. So actually the process of producing the documentary happened very fast. Uh, we discussed on the Christmas night, 2015, in February, I'm starting the early shooting in Malacca. And uh, the shooting happened all around the, all the year of 2016, we finished Actually, we finished also close to the 25th December in 2016, almost close one year, the, all, the whole process. So it did, um, for me, happened this way. So it was also for me a process of discovery about area of Malacca 
that, um, well, is not a, a well-known figure. Uh, there is, in terms of facts, in terms of um, books about uh, area of Malacca, practically is none, except one, the Paglima one, that is a novel, is a fiction, that was writing by, um, uh, some, uh, the name is uh, uh, Aram Amri Rushid. I think I'm spelling uh, the, the, on the correct way. So regarding to this, to this area of Malacca, even nowadays we don't know the real name of, of uh, area of Malacca. So for me, it's also a, a process of discovery. Uh, the relation between uh, Magellan, Henry, the, the old expedition around the world, and the, the big possibility of Henry of Malacca be the first man that actually complete a travel around the world. You see, um, for what we know, Magellan met uh, Henry in Malacca at the age of 15, 16, you know, um, a, a young boy that uh, he, took, he took him to Portugal, uh, to, to Africa, and then uh, also introduced him to the King of Spain. And then both they start this big journey of trying to find a new route to the spicy islands through West. Um, and this is how I'm starting with this, with, with this, uh, with this project. Me and, of course, many also researchers, like in Portugal, in Spain, in Malaysia, we also interview a lot of uh, researchers to, to help us on building the, the, the narrative of the, the documentary. Uh, so you did not know about the subject before your... Encounter. No, I, I know I know about um, Magellan because Magellan it was a it was a Portuguese captain, right? Mm -hmm. um, Magellan also was on the, the conqueror of Malacca in 1511. Actually, Magellan was also on the 1509 when the Portuguese approached Malacca for the first time, and then he returned in 1511. So in in school we learn a bit about Magellan, of course, mm -hmm. and also the the area of Malacca we we hear. There and you see, it's not it's not well known figure. So we know about this this friend starting as a servant of Magellan, then became a friend. But of course, the the main character is is uh, the Magellan, uh, the, the captain of Portugal that create this, the, the the journey. Uh, yeah, and um, and so I have studied a bit more about and try to find facts about area of of, of Malacca that um, that happened. For example, reading the, the, the Pigafetta book, Pigafetta was the writer that, uh, that followed Magellan on this voyage uh, uh, 500 years ago. So uh, I was digging on the, on the book of Pigafetta, trying to find more facts about the area, uh, area of Malacca. Mm -hmm. So uh, and would you like me to share your trailer? Please, if, if you want, please, Simon, you, you, can, you can show the trailer, please. All right, um, hang on a second. Okay, uh, so it should be on the screen now and I'm gonna play, uh, mm -hmm. it's two minutes long. Malacca, which was opened up in about the late 14th century. And according to the Portuguese, Malacca became the busiest port in the world. In the context of the conquest of Malacca, in which Fernando Magalhães participated, that enters in scene a personage, a historic person called Henrique de Malacca, who came to be companheiro de, de Fernando Magalhães, sabe sim que ele acompanhou Fernando Magalhães quando este regressou a Portugal uh, e veio ter uma importância in, uh, relevante no projeto de Magalhães na sua viagem à volta do mundo. Dizermos que Henrique era natural de Malaca é estarmos a aceitar como verdadeira o testamento do próprio Magalhães Embora haja outras informações e outras crónicas, mas é verdadeiramente mais fiável uh, a versão que diz que ele seria natural de Malaca, porque o próprio Magalhães diz, o diz uh, no seu testamento. Tensions was always there among the crews, 
especially among the Portuguese and the Spaniards. Temos que caminho de onde não chegamos a sítio nenhum. Os homens estão cansados. Vai, Ninguém acreditou em mim. Rei de Espanha, não acredito. Estamos aqui para cumprir a nossa missão. Enquanto eu for capitão deste navio, é isto que estamos a fazer, é isto que vamos fazer até o fim. Depois, um oceano incalculablemente largo. Depois de haber conseguido todo, Magallanes é echa todo a perder precisamente por esta idea de exaltación de un transporte que yo casi llamaría místico. In the past, people always said Magellan was the first man to circumnavigate the world. But actually, he died in the Philippines. He did not complete the journey. But Panglima Awang went back to Malacca. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. You certainly wet our appetite, Pedro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we all cannot wait to actually watch the documentary. Uh, I hope in Malaysia will happen in the future. When the pandemic calms down, I hope that uh, we can hope to open there in, in Malaysia for sure. Yeah, inshallah. Uh, so uh, maybe to build on what you have shared with us, uh, I was wondering if I could call on uh, Ahmad Fuad Osman next, uh, who has also you know, explored the museological construction, uh, has explored the museological construction of uh, and the representation of Enrique de Malacca. In a way, uh, it's uh, really sort of like trying to uh, push us to uh, think about the challenges of working with the limitation of material, historical material. And uh, as a result of this limitation, how do we then sort of like circum what, what what can art offer us uh, as, a, as a means to circumvent this limitation? Uh, Fuad, I wonder if you want to share a bit about your memorial project and how you're thinking about uh, the memory of Enrique de Malacca and its connection to our part of the world. Okay, thank you, Simon. And uh, thank you to all the committees and the organizers of uh, this event. Um, I'm happy to be part of this project and to share my, my experience in my uh, project Enrique de Malacca Memorial. <clears throat> well, for me, uh, I basically discovered Enrique uh, much, much earlier. I mean, like 35 years ago, I was around 15 or 16. Um, I was still in school. I, I found this small uh, book, uh, my mom's old book. Uh, it's called Panglima Awang. And um, after I read it, you know, the, 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 the feeling that I, I felt that, you know, during that time, I was, I was quite, um, it was exciting. Uh, to imagine someone from here, you know, the possibility of someone from here actually to be the first one to circumnavigate the world instead of uh, Magellan, the one that we always, uh, we, we know that, that whatever that we learned in school. And um, to me, I was, I was, I was uh, it was really um, uh, exciting, but because, you know, I, I was never, um, I mean, I, I never thought of becoming an artist. So the, the, the experience or the, the feeling or the, it's just, it's just there, it just stayed there. Uh, and then years after that, um, after I graduate uh, from UITM, uh, Fine Arts, I became an artist. Then in 2005, uh, I moved my studio from Kuala Lumpur, moved down to uh, Malacca. Then suddenly this uh, memory of Enrique, of Panglima Awang came back. And um, it was one of the projects that I wanted to really explore at that time. 
and then um, 2005, I, I started. I started to to try to look for some materials to to work on it. But unfortunately, there, there's, I mean, that not much uh, materials uh, that I can find. Even in in Malacca Museum, there's not much material around. And then in uh, 2005. Uh, late 2005, I have to stop because uh, I moved uh, to uh, Korea for a, a year-long residency, and the uh, project halted again. And then I, when I came back in 2006, I started, you know, the project again. But when I started the project, um, I found it. Um, um, I mean. It, it, it can't be present. Maybe we can we can go on the slides, huh? the uh, Simon. Simon will help me a bit with the slides. Uh, okay, the book that I first. Let me know where, where do you want me to stop. Or okay. Should I go on? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, this this was the 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 book that I read in eighty five or eighty six, and I was around fifteen. So this Panglima Awang um, introduced me to Enrique de Malacca. And, um, and then I moved to Malacca. Uh, next slide, Simon. Yeah, that um, I, I was in Malacca. And then uh, um, I started to research. And I, start, I started to have a feeling that I, I cannot represent the character Enrique de Malacca just by one piece of painting or just uh, a piece of sculpture because the figure is, is much bigger than that. So I'm imagining him as, as a bigger project. But of course, it, it involves a lot of funding, you know. Uh, I, need, I need bigger funding. And the project halted again, so I have to do something else and work on other projects until 2016. Uh, next, Simon. Uh, sorry, 2015. A curator from uh, Singapore Museum called me up. Uh, this is re regarding the Singapore Biennale for B Singapore Biennale 2016. And uh, she asked me if my work have anything that deals with um, Asian maritime history? Well, I, I told her at that time, um, I never have anything like that before, but I do have something that I, I would really like to explore more. I would like, I would like to, to uh, produce. And I told her a bit about this whole story of um, uh, Enrique de Malacca, uh, Magellan, the circumnavigation of, of the world. And um, it, it's not just about uh, Southeast Asian or Nusantara maritime history. It touches also you know, in the bigger scope, you know, it's, it's a global uh, scope. And um, she's interested in that. So he, she asked me to send in the proposal. And uh, I sent in the proposal and that's, that's how it goes. You know, they, they like the proposal, they like the idea. And um, so um, they commissioned me for the Singapore Biennale in 2016. So that's how the work was, was produced. So I, I started working on this in 2000, early 2016 actually, until um, the opening around, uh, five, six months to, to produce the, um, the work, which initially I wanted to call it, uh, which, you know, I, I imagine as a museum, but I don't want to call it the museum because uh, it's a bit scary because it, it sounds a bit too big. So I turn it to, to I, I mean, I, I call it uh, um, memorial. So it could be, you know, could be just a small room. It, it could also be a memorial instead of, of um, a museum, right? So I call it um, Enrique de Malacca Memorial Project. So for, I think for the introduction of how, you know, I came to, to uh, produce 
the project. That's that's how. Well, one. Uh, so, uh, should we save the slides for later? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, to build on that, uh, if uh, for Fuad, it's a question of memorializing is interested in exploring the uh, uh, Enrique to, uh, as a figure that needs to be remembered. Uh, I wonder if Louis, you could share your take on Enrique. You seem to have highlighted another aspect of Enrique as a go-between figure. And this reminds me, of course, of uh, Stephen Greenblatt's uh, characterization of a class of protagonists that made cultural interaction possible across the early modern world. And uh, did you have that in mind when you cast Enrique as a go-between figure? And what was his role in Black Henry? Well, first of all, thank you to the organizers for this very pertinent uh, conference. Um, and glad to be on this panel with uh, the distinguished participants. <clears throat> In terms of Enrique uh, de Malaca, I got interested partly because, you know, when I was growing up, my father would kid all of us, his children, that we were descendants of Lapu Lapu. And so I began to be curious about who Lapu Lapu was. And then in school, we learned about Magellan, but nothing about Enrique. So in many ways, Enrique is the undiscovered indigenous self that was overshadowed by the colonial history that the Philippines had. But at any rate, I read the journals of Pigafetta <clears throat> that was referred to earlier um, in the early 90s, I was able to borrow uh, the uh, one of a, it was a rare book because it had a facsimile of the one of the original manuscripts. So I read that <clears throat> and it struck me that Enrique is the prototype of the modern global Filipino. And in Cebu, he becomes important. When you read Bigafetta, he doesn't make an appearance until the expedition gets to Cebu. And suddenly he becomes very important because he speaks the language. He looks like the islanders. And of course he speaks by now Spanish and Portuguese. So he becomes this link between the West and the East. And so I began to think, well, what kind of a person was he? What was his relation to his master? You know, because in Southeast Asia at that time, there was also the slave raiders. Um, and so I fictionalized a bit because, you know, my play is, uh, uh, fiction based on true events. And so I imagined him as being a captive and a slave um, to Magellan. <clears throat> and as I think Ahmad points out, and Pedro as well, he was a kid, you know, he was 15, 16, but by the time they get to the Philippines, he's a grown man. They've experienced a lot of hardships, and he is um, faithful in the sense of doing all that was necessary to survive and to thrive uh, with Magellan as, the, uh, as his master. Because you have to remember, most of the crew were Europeans. Um, there was certainly racism on the part of the crew who were mostly white skinned. And so that became a factor in the way I thought of their relationship. Although of course uh, that comes out later in the play. And I believe uh, I provided the link uh, which people 
can view whenever they have the time. So I started to probe the character of Enrique. And, you know, it's also symbolic that he becomes basically the first known overseas Filipino worker and the first Balik Bayan, which is the Tagalog word meaning returning to the home country. And of course, you know, I joke with my friends in saying that he was the first Balik Bayan, but he didn't know he was returning home, so he didn't have any gifts, okay? And so we don't really know what happens to him after the ships, I think they were down to three, leave uh, the Philippines and return to Spain. And only one ship uh, makes it back to Sevilla. So Enrique, Enrique to me is both a human being and a symbol of the modern day Filipino. You know, if you look at the merchant marine and the cruise industry, uh, the majority of workers are Filipinos. And there's always been in Southeast Asia this sailing tradition and working on ships. So that will give you an idea of how I thought of Enrique in terms of his indigeneity and his race and his relationship <clears throat> with Magellan. And secondly, of course, I had to think of the character of Magellan. And it seemed to me too easy to portray him as a kind of villain, you know, the conquistador, because he was a human being. And so to have Enrique work with him for 10 years means they had a relationship that was uh, that worked and and Magellan was a tough son of a bitch but from all the accounts he was a fair uh, person and he treated Enrique fairly because in his will he oh. said that upon my death uh, Enrique will be a free man he will be given 10,000 maravedis from my estate and he can be whatever he wants. But of course, the uh, person who takes over refuses to grant his, uh, Magellan's wish and says, as long in the play, as long as I'm the captain, you will remain a slave. And thus is set up the rebellion that ends in, you know, tragically. Okay, so that's the way. I conceived Enrique and I got a grant to be in Cebu in 2003. And of course, if you go to Mactan, there's this huge, there's this memorial to Magellan. And I think only fairly recently did you have a statue of Lapu Lapu. And it's a weird statue because <clears throat> he looks like he's been working out in the gym you know, like kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger. But in reality, you know, he was typical Malayan, slim but fast and an expert in the native martial arts. You know, so that's uh, more or less the long and short of it, the background of uh, Enrique and Magellan. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. And uh, good luck. I'll come back. Uh, and uh, I'm going to bring you on next. Uh, so I feel like you, amongst all the panelists here today, is uh, perhaps the most uh, visible in trying to uh, bring Enrique back from history as a way to address our present day condition. Uh, I was wondering how did Enrique? What uh, speak to you in, the, in 1979 when you first attempted to put together a feature film about Enrique de Malacca? And what does Enrique mean to you today? Well, I guess I've been living with Enrique de Malacca for more than 40 years. <laughs> a long time. <laughs> and uh, more than half of my life now. Um, yeah, so it's more than a film or just a film project. Uh, 
I think with my sons growing up, I also let them have bedtime stories which created chapters or episodes. Um, well, just to start with, I, I first heard about Enrique. Um, I, I, I was referring more to e, as Iking. Um, from a Philippine his, history uh, icon, Carlos Quirino, and who I think when he was connected with the National Historical Institute, um, got Pigafetta's book published here in the Philippines. Um, Satoto, so I really uh, got interested in him because at that time, I had just finished the, my film, Who Invented the Yo-Yo, Who Invented the Moon Buggy? By the way, the answer to that is Filipinos. <laughs> if I, and so when I got this possibility, hey, baka yung unang umikot sa mundo, maybe the first guy to go around the world was somebody from our part of the world. Um, I got into it and I didn't do as much academic research like most people would probably want to do before they get to a project. I, I just read a few parts of the Pigafetta book and got an idea about it. And I said, okay, first man to play the yo-yo on, uh, on the moon from my film was uh, a Filipino. Okay, just to get a little flavor of it, uh, let, let me play a clip, uh, and I hope this works. Oh, I had a little technical problem a while ago. You lost me for some time, but I, uh, I, I guess I share. Okay. And maybe I can still talk while it's going on. Yes. Anyway, this is the opening talking. shot of my film. Okay. And uh, I try to uh, break away from so that the historians won't lynch me, I try to show the slave as somebody from my part of the world. You know, we had the test earlier. And... Yeah, yeah, this one, this one, this one, sorry, sorry. This one. By the way, uh, Memories of Overdevelopment was my working title. It has never meant to be the, the full title of my film. I don't know why. Um, yeah, it can start here, but... See, see, Now a free man has returned home to his native village. On the soundtrack, we should hear sounds of a wild boar. How can I get this? The yo yo is not a toy for Enrique. The yo yo is recorded in a 17th century French document as an original Philippine jungle weapon. Enrique comes from Itugao, a province where woodcarvers are abundant today. Throughout the film, we will see Tigafetta writing entries of the voyage into his journal. But Enrique, being a illiterate, carves his memories of the voyage. Okay. Okay. Keep talking. Okay. Um, that is basically my opening sequence to show that I'm not trying to be a historian. <laughs> I included him as an Ifugo, which is from my part of the world, partly because it was also an easy way to put him in a costume. And uh, I didn't want to go into the boxing ring of uh, the academicians. They, I understand how they build their blocks and make their history. So I don't want to get into any arguments uh, whether Enrique Iking was a, from this part of the world, the Philippines, or whether he is Sumatran as some people have uh, indicated, uh, or 
as in the last will, he's called Enrique de Malaca. Let's just agree that he's an Austronesian. He's from this part of the world, from this part of the islands. And maybe that language um, capacity of Enrique when he got to Cebu, we can split hairs on whether it was only kings who could speak multi-languages. I think it's very significant that we're always used to Western history. And of course the historians, they have been, very, the European historians have been very anal about writing every little detail about what their conquistadors did. And we always go by that history that, well, sila pala yung palaging bida, sila yung panalo. They're the, they're the heroes always of their historical um, saga. So, but when this uh, thing came to my attention, I said, it's interesting. And I, although Pigafetta only mentions Enrique four or five times in, in the book, uh, I think the gray areas <laughs> make it fascinating for an artist to, to play. Now, is play always bad? Uh, maybe I have been able to envision a character who interacts with a well-known history uh, character in history. Uh, a while ago, Luis was talking about whether um, Magellan was the son of a bitch, <laughs> but maybe I think he was. He was. He had a. I think from his last will and testament, we know he had a, a kind of a warm or kindly attitude towards Enrique. And from there, I think I later I will show footage just just uh, how I developed that relationship between the slave and the master. Um, I don't use a, I don't write a script. I start. I know, I know I have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Uh, this guy comes from somewhere here, and he, by circumstance, uh, hitchhikes on somebody who has access to technology, somebody who has access to the, the king's money, somebody who has ex access to the. <clears throat> latest maps from the university uh, chart makers. Uh, in other words, Magellan is Mr. Logistics. He's the guy who gets the ships and the knowledge together. But I think in the end, while he was the material master in this voyage, maybe the spiritual master might have been somebody else. <laughs> Maybe, and I don't have any archival material to say that Enrique had some cosmology that made him, as an Austronesian, say, hey, let's try this way, or a homey instinct that, hmm, I want to go home <laughs> and find my way home. So this kind of play between my uh, fantasy and a few facts that I got from and uh, from Pigafetta got me on this 40 year voyage. <laughs> uh, and as you, for those of you who didn't recognize that guy carrying the piece of wood and playing the yo-yo, that was me in 1979. And uh, as I continue the saga, of course, I cannot prevent my hair from turning white. But yeah, I think, let me end on that. Uh, just how I got interested in it, but it has become part of my daily life for the last four decades. And I hope, I'm, I'm very happy that now I'm still alive in 2021, that this is 500 years. Wow, pare ko, limang daan na, we're here. And we're celebrating, and of course for the rest of the world, we'll be celebrating Magellan and all those conquistadors, but and here we're celebrating Lapu Lapu. And I think for people on this panel, we're, hey, <laughs> there's also another unsung hero, Enrique de Malaca, Ikeng, who 
did what the great ambitious inquisitors try to do. So that's how I started on this project and I'm, I'm still on it. Really, who would have thought that Enrique was ultimately an Ikudao? I never, but that's very, very refreshing. Uh, it got me thinking that uh, we, we can speculate so owing to the fact that there are these gray areas that, as you have so put it right, that opens the past into play. And I think our first audience question uh, is asking for further elaboration from our panelists on this very issue. Uh, it's a question coming from Antonio de Castro uh, to our panelists. Uh, he asks, it would seem that Enrique drops out of any extent of historical records after Humabon turns his back on the Spaniards as a result of the defeat of Magellan by Lapu Lapu in Mactan in 1521. Would any of the panelists or participants want to comment on this? Uh, and I think maybe to be more specific, Antonio, if I may, and feel free to respond if I'm interpreting a question. Uh, my guess is you're trying to ask what happens when the historical trails turn, turn cold and how did our panelists lean on art to address or explore this absence of historical sources? Um, anyone wants to take a stab? Uh, please, Luis. Well, <clears throat> this is where the uh, dramatist and creative imagination takes over because Enrique does not return with the ships. Um, he, according to Pigafetta, Humabon, realizing that Magellan is not after all this magical warrior, because earlier in, <clears throat> in his dealings with Magellan, Magellan claims that any one of his men is worth a hundred of the indigenous soldiers. So he says, I can take care of Lapu Lapu. I don't need your help, you know, and he goes and of course, uh, Lapu Lapu kicks his ass. And Enrique is with him, fights alongside, gets injured, and they return to the ship. And um, Humabon realizes that uh, Magellan, after all, um, is not, you know, this great fantastical figure. And once Enrique is treated badly by the second master, his new amo, you know, as we say in Filipino, uh, he decides to um, turn against uh, Magellan and he concocts a plan uh, to get revenge on uh, Barbosa and the rest of the crew. So they hold, he persuades Humabon to hold his feast in like, uh, as we say, a despedida, which is the Spanish for a farewell party. But you know, at that feast, uh, it turns into a uh, slaughter. And this is in Pigafetta's journal as well. And Enrique isn't mentioned in the combat scene, but I just said, well, Enrique was there, so he must have participated. And of course, he's pissed off at the fact that he's not a free man, and he should be. So you know, I have him fight, and of course, you know, for drama, I have him fight the bad guy, Barbosa, you know, so it's a climax. And so one reason he doesn't return is my interpretation. He most likely, we don't know what actually happened to him. He might have returned to his home village, you know, looking for his roots, the same way that um, people in the diaspora, you know, who travel to foreign countries return to the Philippines looking to see if they re can reconnect with what they left behind. You know, so rather than get into that and spoiler alert, you know, I have him and Barboza kill each other in the end. Okay, but 
the ending of the play, once you see it, has a the burial of uh, Enrique with Muslim rites. And then the concert of Humabon, Humamai, is actually a real convert to Catholicism. And, you know, I figured this out because the Santo Nino, the uh, image of the child Jesus, was given to her by Magellan and rediscovered by the 1565 expedition of Miguel Legaspi. And so my belief is that she actually believed in uh, Catholicism. And so the ending image of the play as visualized virtually is the Santo Nino, you know, with uh, Humamai and a priest saying the Our Father. Okay, so there's this um, contrast between the Islamic faith and the Catholic faith that ends the play, you know. So in a way, it, Pigafetta, by not telling us what happens to Enrique, that was my opening to try and figure out, you know, what was he thinking? What did he do? And how did he, he the, the rest of his life um, wind up? So I hope I also that... Can I... Sorry, sorry. Can I come in, um, Simon? I also want to say something. <laughs> please, Kidla, please. Okay. Um, as uh, if I would be stuck with Pigafetta, of course, uh, the last thing we know is that uh, Pigafetta said Enrique was more cunning than we had thought, in effect, accusing him of being part of the massacre at the end. Um, I have a, again, <laughs> with all my artistic life. So I don't get into battle with uh, historians. Um, I let me show you in a minute and a half of my clip. Uh, where let's start with the battle of Pulapu. When Lapulapu tries to avoid the physical war and uses ang bamboo instruments to no, do a noise barrage, but in the end he feels he has to fight. And okay, let's uh, share the screen. Here, here. Play. Okay. On board the ship, one of the sailors panics and fires a cannon. There is no choice. <laughs> So, um, as Luigi said, maybe uh, he went back to his village to seek his roots. The village welcomes back Enrique and rejoices, not necessarily at the first circumnavigation of the globe, but just at the return of a lost son. And so Enrique returned to be able to tell future generations about the first Circumnavigation of the globe. So, um, <laughs> I think I get away with history by allowing an interpretation, which I think everybody can agree that if he got back to his village, of course, there was a, a festival. Um, I tried to get away from the arguments of whether he was part of a conspiracy. Uh, it was just somebody with a wanderlust who 
by letting the cosmos bring him here and there, um, found his way across the world to another culture. And uh, I think here, I want to play just one more clip of how, um, another one minute clip, which, because I saw Pedro Sousa's, um, which one? This one, that one, that one. Yeah, that, it's just there, really. okay. This is the Canyon. No, 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 one? sorry. Uh, this Sevilla. one, this one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, in a way, uh, the meeting of um, of um, a okay, we have a flash forward a couple of years. Magellan had quit Portugal because the king of Portugal refuses to finance the big voyage that Magellan now plans to find a western route. He is now in Spain, in Sevilla, and after two years, he finally gets an appointment with King Carlos I. So, uh, in a way, he's in his cultural gear uh, when he meets the king. And uh, although um, Magellan has, whether he's using him as a prop uh, to convince the king that somebody in his team knows the way to the Spice Islands, uh, it's not important for me. I think it was just to have later he's coming back at the end of the film and that Kanyao, that dancing scene is just a way of closing uh, his reconnection to his homeland. Uh, it's not the same way as in the language uh, factor, which has been interesting uh, historians that maybe because he spoke a language in this area, I take it more that <laughs> because he could dance in that the same cultural dances in that area, he was completing his own circle. Thank you. That was my little <laughs> contribution. Go ahead, Pedro. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so about this, this topic that raised by, by the question, um, and because I did the documentary, um, it's a more specific genre in terms of um, information. Uh, so I have to stick a bit about with the Pigafetta book, uh, because this was uh, is maybe the only one book that we have that gives some information about the old voyage and a bit about an area of, of uh, 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 Malacca. Actually, uh, Pigafetta say that after the events in Cebu, they lost contact with Henry. It's correct, he tell that. Uh, Pigafetta never say that he's a, a traitor. We can assume by his words, but he, he, he's not specific say that Henry is a traitor. Actually, we don't know what happened on, on, that, on that event. Um, maybe the king, uh, I, I interviewed some uh, uh, teacher and he told me, maybe the king of Cebu, he went to take the boats because he saw the power of the boats when they, 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 when they arrived to Cebu, the canyons, you know, fire and, and the power of the, the boats is, is, is very, is very big. So maybe the king of Cebu uh, make the dinner for, you know, for that, create that event and kill some of the, of the, the Spanish crew. So uh, there is anything that say that uh, Henry is a traitor. Okay, uh, of course, uh, after the death of Magellan, and like he write on this wheel, uh, Henry will be um, a free man. Uh, uh, actually, the brother-in-law took his place, the place of Magellan, on, on, uh, as, as the master of, of the expedition. And of course, he, he wanted to bring Henry to, to Spain as a slave. 
Um, uh, but there is some records. Uh, one of the, 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 the crew members that arrived um, to Spain uh, one year after the, this event, uh, one of the 18 men that came in the, the Chip Vitoria and arrived back to, 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 to Spain is a Portuguese uh, uh, sailor. He told that after Cebu, the three boats uh, actually, two boats, they're around that area. Uh, so after the, the, the Cebu, they don't go straight to Spain. The crew, the, the ship was around uh, Cebu, uh, Borneo, uh, almost touched Malaysia, then back again to the Philippines. And one of, of the crew say that he sees someone in Borneo similar to the slave of Magellan. This is writing on, the, on some records in, in Spain. So following this logic, uh, if, if it is true uh, that the, the Portuguese seller uh, saw someone similar to the slave of Magellan in Borneo, you see, is already a clue from Cebu, maybe, Henry, take a boat easily to Borneo and from Borneo return to Malacca. So one more time, they open the possibility of the, it be the first man that travel uh, um, around the world. But one more, we are assuming things. We don't have 100% proofs, uh, you see. Uh, something that, that I, I found during the, the research for the documentary, and I interview many, uh, many people, even about Magellan nowadays, we don't have much information. It's also a lot of um, uh, suppose that happened this way, suppose even the, the first meeting that he had with the, the King of Portugal, actually, we, we really don't know what happened during the meeting? If he tried to sell his project of expedition around the world or find a new route to the, to the space, there is no records what happened. So we just assume things. You see, even about Magellan, there is the information is also not much as we think. With time, of course, many novelists, many, many writers trying to dig and, and try to find more information about Magellan. But uh, actually, the both, even the both chapters, they have that in common. There is no much, of course, Magellan have more information and is less, but even the, they have this in common. There is no much information uh, that we can just pick a book and say, this happened like this way. And uh, on that note, I think, uh, Fua, do you want to jump in? I thought what was interesting in your case is that you took a rather different approach uh, out of your memorial project. I thought I wanted to, to still uh, respond, to, but we are running late, I think, right? Uh, no, we can sort of like go on. Okay, in an hour, right? <laughs> uh, oh, so you, you have nothing to respond? Or you don't want to respond to this? Yeah, no, I mean, um, if... Um, uh, I'm going back to the question, what happened? I don't know from whom, eh? just now, eh? from whom? The, um, what happened to Enrique after the massacre, right? Um, this one, I think um, I'm very much um, the same approach. I mean, I mean uh, my approach to the project is very much with um, Kidla. You know, this void in between the gray area that makes the thing you know make, makes it interesting so uh the things that we don't know you know and we as an artist can reinterpret it and um <clears throat> well i'm i mean during 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 my research and there's another thing that um give me um, maybe I could call it the material also, you know, the counterclaims in between these three nations, uh, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And um, it's very interesting now that Pedro said there's, there's a, a, a document, someone saw uh, a figure that looked like Enrique. Similar, look like. Look like Enrique in Borneo, which I never heard of before, you know. And this is new for me. This is very interesting. And uh, in um, um, in Cebu, where I did I did um, some interview with, with the people there. Um, uh, most of them they really believe that after the massacre, um, Enrique just stay on, just stay there, and they got married there, and um, 
go back to Kaka and have a descendant until today. But then, uh, unfortunately, I asked them if there are any descendants that I could go and you know meet them, and they can't provide me. But uh, that one also, I, I know it's it's from uh, Quirino. Um, you know the the history of uh, Enrique from from Kaka from uh, uh, Philippines, but uh, for the Malaysian version, um, Enrique after after the massacre, which obviously he's uh, much alive. Um, uh, some said that he followed a Bugis prince back to Sumatra first, because he was wounded and he went back uh, to Sumatra to heal himself. And then after a while, he came back to um, uh, Malacca, but because uh, Malacca at that time was still under Portuguese, he cannot get back to Malacca. So he went down to, he went to uh, Negris Milan to join a, a small community of uh, Sumatra, the Minang, Minangkabau people there. And um, there's also claim today that the, um, there's a grave of uh, Enrique. But uh, when he's, he went back to Negris Milan, he changed his name to Datuk Laut Dalam. He didn't use uh, Enrique de Malacca because at that time, maybe uh, the Portuguese is still looking after him. And then he changed his name to uh, Datuk Laut Dalam. So he, he, he stayed on in Negris Milan and um, he was supposed to die there. And there's a grave there. But the grave is Datuk Laut Dalam's uh, grave, which uh, there's another historian said that when he checked, you know, the, the timing, the timeline doesn't match, you know. So uh, still, we can't really sure that uh, this Datuk Laut Dalam is actually uh, Enrique. And then there's another um, uh, theory, which is also, I, 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 I just got it also uh, lately. Um, after the massacre, because uh, during the negotiation between uh, Magellan and uh, Raja Humabon and uh, Enrique, was an interpreter. And there's another guy from Thailand, Siam, from, from Thai. Uh, he was helping them. You know, so it's not really directly between uh, just Enrique and Raja Humabon. There's another, another guy interpreting, a uh, 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 Siamese merchant. And uh, this guy, which... Uh, He's a historian. He actually did a book, a big book for Malacca Museum, you know, called Panglima Awang, the first uh, Malay to circumnavigate the world. Uh, he's one of the three historians. They went through all, all the, the routes. And he, for him, he think that Enrique came back to Malacca with this interpreter, with this uh, Siamese merchant, which also I think it, it's is possible. But what, what I'm, I'm trying to say here is that, um, you know, get back to uh, Kidla, uh, this gray area that makes it interesting for us as a visual artist to enter the rigid territory of history. You know, so uh, that's my, my, my response to that. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, so maybe it's not so not the, really the role of artists to educate historical accuracy, right? But that's not to say one intentionally produces falsehood, but rather the artist seems uh, is consciously always seeking out all these gray areas because these are areas that offer us a different way to think about how history can make sense to specific communities, peoples, and individuals. And part yeah. of what I really like about your memorial project is that the project. Uh, I was gonna say it really incorporates oral laws and histories. It gave them space, no matter how fantastical they are. Or, and this is given space alongside historical artifacts and latrines uh, to really give us a sense of the plurality of meaning making processes at play uh, when we think about the past. So- Can I add to that? Yeah. Yeah, just that, uh, okay, sometimes we, 
end up arguing on proving 100%. That's been brought up several times. And whenever, even when I have discussions with my historian friends, I just say, okay, I can't, none of us artists were dealing with Enrique, even those children's book uh, by Reni Rojas and uh, Carla Paz's book and, and the play of, of Luis, no? Uh, I don't think we're out to prove 100% that he, Enrique was the first person to circumnavigate the world. But my counter argument to them is, but given all these circumstantial um, evidences that we have, I think that the historians cannot also prove 100% that he is not the first circumnavigator. I think the fact that he is in the will of, last will of the Testament of Magellan, plus the fact that uh, he's mentioned in Picafetas with several, uh, especially his language capacity. I think from that, we can still open up that possibility and enjoy it <laughs> and share it with our fellow uh, people in our islands. And mm -hmm. just, just to also say, hey, history is not the monopoly of you guys out there. Right. So, I'd like to add that I think it was Carl Sagan who said, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I mean, to me, in a way, from our discussions, Enrique becomes kind of a Malayan Elvis. He's alive, he never died. So he becomes an archetype for a certain type of diasporic uh, sojourner. You know, his spirit still lives. And I think when I think back on it, I think that's what my father meant when he was joking when we were kids that we were all descendants of Lapu Lapu. And so given the state of the Philippines and the fact that globalization didn't just begin, you know, in the 18th century, but goes way back to those days, you know, when these voyages were um, epic, and so Enrique becomes a mythological person, and so which is great for artists and writers because then we can make him, you know, play a certain role um, in many ways, you know. So he's not bound by the restrictions that uh, historians, certainly conventional historians. I mean, there are historians who are well aware that their um, discipline has a lot of porous boundaries, you know, and so they, uh, the really good historians don't say this is definitive, but they suggest. And I think art in many ways also suggests in a way that's both contra and parallel to history, you know, and I think we should see them as complementary. Um, so to me, Enrique is, lives beyond, um, you know, his role, his human role. He becomes this uh, vehicle into which many of us can pour our feelings and frustrations. That's a very nice uh, note to lead us into our second part because I uh, want to uh, move on to dwell a bit on each of your creative process. Uh, um, and I was wondering, maybe we can start with Louis uh, since you already have the mic. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, the making of your work, uh, um, specifically about the creative process itself? What were the challenges of representing Enrique in all the complexity that Enrique means to you. And I got a sense he's a archetypal sort of uh, figure that represents the diasporic condition of, uh, of our contemporary times. Uh, how do you, what are, what, are, what, are, what are the challenges for you at the creative level to make this manifest in your play? Uh, that's a pretty broad question because there were many challenges in terms of creating a character who would live on the page and therefore live on the stage as well. So certainly one aspect was the question of race, you know, because that's one 
that's the main reason for why I titled the play Black Henry. And of course, when we were, when I was revising the play, like two, three years ago, uh, Black Lives Matter came into existence. And so I thought, well, that's coincidental or not? You know, so Enrique's life mattered and matters in terms of the way we represent him. So race had to be a major issue, but I did not want to hit people on the head with obvious, um, with messaging. I wanted it to come out. And of course, by the time they get to Cebu, you know, he's been with Magellan 10 years. He knows the crew members. They call him uh, Enrique El Negro. Um, and so the racism comes in bits and pieces. You know, it's never straight out uh, racism, but it's mainly through the actuations of uh, Barbosa, you know, because he's the one who's hostile to Enrique, and that's partly because of race. So I had to make sure that race was an integral part of the way I developed the character. And in in terms of challenges of presenting it, we had originally wanted to present it on stage. This was before the pandemic. And of course, once the pandemic hit, we didn't really have a physical stage and we had to then do it virtually. And that was really difficult because if we look at ourselves now, the Zoom, we're all lined up, right? But if you imagine all of us on the panel as characters, if I'm speaking as Enrique to Barbosa, you know, do I turn left or right? So the director and the uh, cinematographer had to make sure that the actors had specific ways to look. They would say, okay, um, Alberto, you need to look to your left. And Ramon, you need to look to your right. So they would look like, like they were in the same space talking to one another. And then we had to pre-record certain films, like anyone who watches the virtual presentation, there's the battle scene that was actually filmed on Coney Island <laughs> on the beach, okay? Uh, the pandemic meant there are very few people. So we got a friend who's a martial art, a Filipino martial artist, Arnis. So they used the Arnis uh, and it's in silhouette. So it kind of reminds people of the Wayang Kulit, the Indonesian shadow play, because we didn't want to make it, you know, we didn't have any money. We had a bare bones budget. So we shot it with one camera. And there was a funny incident because uh, we brought a cross or the cinematographer and the director brought a cross to the beach. And when they were filming, this woman comes along and is angry and saying, what are you doing with the cross? You know, this is blasphemy. <laughs> and so the Claro, the director and uh, Charles, the cinematographer said, no, no, ma'am, we're just setting up a scene. And they bring Magellan and he's bowing in front of the cross. And the lady is okay, okay, but she's kind of suspicious. So, I mean, that would have been great to include, <laughs> but that would have involved a lot more technical wizardry. And finally, we did have, we, we did it through NYU. And NYU hired a person who's very good at mixing uh, the virtual space with film and images. And in a way, writing the play was the easy part. Staging it virtually was very difficult. I'd like also to add that in a way we circumnavigated the globe because we had three people in three different parts of the globe. Uh, Enrique was played by an actor from the Philippines. We had actors from the west coast and actors in new york so that was one advantage of doing it virtually because if we wanted to do it on stage we wouldn't have had the money to bring in 
people from elsewhere. Yeah. No, it's my first impression on the title of your play, Black Henry. I uh, immediately made the association and hit and connecting it to the Black Atlantic for some reason. Of course, and we, we crossed the Atlantic uh, before the slave trade came into being proper in the late 16th century. Yet, you know, as a as a slave himself, it almost seems like he presaged he presaged the Black Atlantic to come, right? Um, but I, I also felt like there's almost very little effort to imagine Enrique's voyage through the America. And being based in New York, uh, I was wondering if you have any thought on this or if this was ever uh, on your heart, you know, did it ever uh, occur to you or do you ever thought extensively about this? Well, I mean, you know, the play basically focuses on the six weeks that they're in the Philippines. So by then, of course, as you point out, they had crossed the Atlantic, which is relatively better known. And then they, Magellan comes across what is now known as the Straits of Magellan. They cross the Pacific. It's a hellish voyage. And so I think if I understand your question, was my being in New York influential in the way I thought of Enrique? Or, or maybe to even think about his time in, uh, in the US, uh, 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 you know, traveling through America. Uh, um, it seems then, to be quite absent from, uh, you know, his global uh, right. learning. They didn't, they basically went to South America Mm -hmm. um, and went down the um, coast yeah. and, and then crossed. Um, they never actually went the other way and hit, um, you know, what is now the United States. Yeah. Uh, so there is no, I mean, I never thought of that, okay. but that would be an interesting exploration. What mm -hmm. would have happened if they had taken a different route, you know? And maybe they would have arrived at uh, the quote new world before uh, the uh, other Europeans arrived. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, can I just comment, Luis? I uh, <clears throat> I saw your play, and I think it's a pity you can't show some clips now. But uh, of course, I got used to images of myself for the for. 40 years and the, the images that I've made, but suddenly, wow, I saw a totally different blocking and different interactions. Like you said, uh, turning left or right on <laughs> and those little circles, those little cameos. Uh, so if I go was, this way, I'm looking away from you. If I go yeah. this way. So stage left, stage right. But I think uh, it was so exciting. I really got so excited. I, I, I saw it on the first day and I got so excited. But you know, that was seven o'clock in the morning here in the Philippines. I got so excited. I woke up my wife the next day to see your second presentation. Uh, it worked and it gave me a totally new uh, framing because uh, I was able to focus also on the text that you wrote and I felt that your interpretations of Enrique were many parallels to mine, but even if our visuals were totally different, uh, wow, congratulations. I think you, <laughs> the pandemic pushed you into a, a, a super interesting interpretation of that time in history. Well, I think, you know, the pandemic is making us zoom together uh, in otherwise healthier times. We would have been, I don't know, in Lisbon or Manila, uh, drinking vino verde or tandoi rum. You know, I mean, I love Zoom in a way, but I miss the in-person interaction, yes. you know? Kila, do you want to take over and um, share a bit about your creative process? Okay, um, well, talk about process and the challenges. <laughs> uh, I think my, my time frame was very different uh, 
I mean, yeah, now we're in a pandemic, but over the years, I guess, when I left, I shelved the film after about eight or nine years of shooting. And at that time it was still 16 millimeter. We were using celluloid. It was a very cumbersome process to even just to keep your film refrigerated in a tropical country. Uh, all those things are now past. And when I finished a short version, which I was showing around the world, I said, even if I don't finish the film in this lifetime, I'd like people to know about who. There's another version of history from the islanders and not necessarily from the pen of somebody from the old continent. So when I decided to resume really full blast, it became a challenge um, partly because, okay, if I were doing a film in the usual casting and big budget, I think yeah, it would be possible for some casting agent to look for somebody who looked like me 35 years ago. Uh, and even the Magellans or, or, or Pigafettas, but all my characters had grown older. We have wrinkles, we have pot bellies. Um, somebody was talking about how slim <laughs> Enrique de Malaco was. Uh, so I, the main thing that was my challenge was, okay, my 20 and uh, my 30 minute version that I've been showing around did not really show that language uh, factor, no? And I thought maybe I should find a way to bring that, well, 500 years later. So I want to show you a clip of uh, how I dealt with, the, the footage that you saw earlier was all me in my younger days. Uh, now let me, I'll show you about two and a half minutes. Okay, it says just how I dealt with it. I used my grandchildren, I used my sons and, uh, and how I dealt with the language, which is what most people who are fascinated okay. that he could speak the language. Go ahead, let's play. How many languages did he learn? Long before the days of his benevolent empire, colonizers knew the formula that Language is the key to empire. How did Magellan Slave become part of that empire? Merely learning to speak Espanol or Portuguese? Repete. Yo. Yo. Yo soy. Yo soy. Yo soy libre. Yo soy libre. Yo soy hombre libre. Yo soy hombre how did Enrique communicate with the islanders? Halika, makinig tayo. Buenos dias, señor. Hablas español? Ma... Ha! Ah. Mahibalo ka magbisaya? Cebuano? Waray, waray! Uh, Polo Cebu? Limasawa! Hey, masawa. Ah. Okay, okay. Waray, waray. Bahala na bukas. Waray, waray. Manigas. Okay, one more time. Waray, waray, waray. Bahala bukas. Waray, waray, waray. Manigas. Waray, waray, waray. Manigas. 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 Estia, señorita. Ah. Hablas español? Ojo que sabot ni mo ako kis tinurihan kay Bisaya. Sibuan? Bisaya? 
Ay, balo. Ito ang mag-Bisaya. O ba? O sa'yo mo ito kay Balan? Ah, isa, dua, sunyo, pat, lima. Kaya, kung sa pa may mga ibang may Balan na binisaya? Bungot? Ah, lubot? Pinti. Ano pula po yung... Ano niyo may Balan na binisaya? Kasi po, sa anak mo, sa inyong mga anak, kalipay. Kaya ako, kung sa'yo pasabot sa kalipay. Kalipay, um, kalipay. Kalipay! Kalipay! Yan, pagbuting ni Magellan, ha? Pasakay siya doon sa bapos. Tapos nakasulat dito. So, the little brown men from the island came to meet them. As the brown men laughed and shouted, Enrique suddenly cried, I understand. Naintindihan mo kung anong sinasabi nila. Yan ang mga usapan namin in our islands. Tapos anong sabi ni Magellan? Ang huh? sabi ni Magellan ngayon, You must be the first man You have gone around the world. You have sailed away from your home to go to Europe. And then you sailed back west from Europe until you reach your home. So, ano ibig sabihin nun? Ibig sabihin, nakabalik na si Enrique sa island niya. Okay, that was a... Am I on mute? That was my challenge, how to continue the story 40 years later without trying to get continuity in the actors who had all <laughs> grown older. But by stylizing it that way, I think uh, it became more personal also because <laughs> it's those are that my Magellan was now played by my son. Uh, and then my grandson has also entered into the picture. Uh, it became a multi-generational way of filling in the blanks. And uh, I guess it paid off 40 years of just waiting for my son to grow and have a big beard looking like Magellan. But these are what you do when you don't have the usual protocols of a big... Hollywood production with big Hollywood money, looking for actors who look like they, you did 35 years ago. And instead telling your story as you let the cosmos guide you through your next scene. And uh, there, Enrique has come home, <laughs> even with white hair. <laughs> Thank you, good luck for sharing. Uh, and um, maybe uh, I can ask Fuad to speak next. Uh, Fuad, um, I was wondering in your memorial project, there's an intentional desire to really blur the lines between what is fact and what is fiction. But, you know, you intentionally manufacture uh, uh, artifacts and these were then sort of like put on display together with real antiques that you have, uh, you know, you, you have amassed. Uh, during the course of your research. What are you hoping to achieve by, you know, uh, showing, uh, you know, these side by side? Uh, and, and how did you come to sort of like decide on this uh, uh, museological method of displaying uh, made objects as well as stuff that, uh, that, that you have also found on the antique market? Uh, okay. Um, Do you want me to... one, one, one of the, yeah, maybe you can, we can um, uh, look at the slides again. Uh, okay, when, um, when I first really uh, kickstart the project, I mean, you know, for, for the Biennale, uh, when I got some backup, you know, some, some funding, then only I can really go deeper into this. Um, 
one of the first thing that I have to solve is how to present this character. How how do you know how do I present him, Enrique de Malacca? First, as Enrique or Panglima Awang. Because I, I I have some 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 people ask me oh, why do you use Enrique why don't you use uh, why um, Panglima Awang uh, that's one of the things that I have to really uh, sort out uh, for me on that question I have to go for anything that is real so Enrique was you know his his written name and we all know that Panglima Awang is only his fictional name. And um, I want to use his, his real name for the, for the memorial. So, and uh, that's one of the things that I have to, to um, uh, negotiate during the first, um, first phase of my research. And um, Another thing is that because of these counterclaims in between these three countries, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia, how do I present him, whether as Malaysian or as Filipino, as uh, Indonesian, even though I'm, I'm a Malaysian? Uh, so I thought I, I cannot really just uh, claim it, claim him as Malaysian just because I'm a Malaysian, even though uh, it, it was stated clearly uh, in uh, Magellan's will that he's a native of Malacca. But then uh, we have, we have uh, other documents also stating uh, him that he was actually from uh, Sumatra, from uh, Pigafetta. But then in uh, Maximiliano's uh, document, he was actually from Moluccas. And then for uh, uh, Carlos Corino, uh, he's from Philippines, from Cebu. So, which is, when, which character, which which uh, which one should I present him? So, uh, at the end of the day, all these things I have to make him like in between. Um, so I chose um, this character um, because according according to Indonesian in, Indonesian uh, historian. Uh, Enrique must have looked like uh, somebody who came from um, uh, Papua. You know, this, this black and a bit of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Australian origin uh, look, something like that. But uh, I thought that it would be a bit too specific on just one side, which I wanted him to be a bit more uh, general. So that, um, but it's, it's also very important for me to to put him um, in an open ending um, platform, so that we can still enter this uh, near mythic character from anywhere that we wanted to until today. So the the dialogue will still be going on. So I intentionally choose that he must have this kind. He must carry this kind of character. So that's why I don't go to, you know, too too black. Even though they call him Henry the Black. Uh, so that's one of the other the thing. And um, uh, in terms of other challenges that I, I have to deal with is that. Uh, because Enrique, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it deals with these uh, three countries. So my research have to cover all these uh, three countries. So I have to cover uh, Philippines and Indonesia, Malaysia. And uh, within a very short period of time, I have to go all the way to all these uh, three countries to interview some people, to... So to manage uh, uh, this project, which um, I think is definitely a collaborative project. Uh, I, can't, I can't produce it alone, of course, because it's the scale of the project. Uh, 
uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, I think I work with around 70 people, you know, for the, the film production, for the um, uh, objects, for the uh, prints, for the painting, for everything, you know. And uh, to manage uh, all these 70 people within these few months is really uh, challenging, is really hectic. I must say. And then, um, uh, Enrique, uh, there are people that, that uh, thought, because uh, for formulation, uh, obviously they are hoping uh, to see uh, Enrique to be represented as a Malay, as a Muslim. And um, which, I mean, in, in the movie, in the main video, which is an anchor to the whole project, um, I somehow try to bring in this uh, Malay elements or Nusantara elements, which I try to incorporate uh, this, um, because I, I have to imagine how come Mag Magellan became very, very close to this guy. He's a slave. He's just an assistant coming all the way from uh, Nusantara. But Magellan treated him very special. And, um, and then also he survived this whole uh, experience, especially with this uh, three, three years uh, expedition. So all these elements I have to think. And in the, the movie, I try to bring out the elements of, uh, you know, the uh, mantra and the Sufi, um, Sufism, Muslims um, uh, teaching inside this uh, video, you know, to, to, to characterize him. Uh, but still, um, I somehow still try to make him as, as open as it could. So that I I don't want to put a uh, to put a full stop just yet because uh, you know there are things that are still coming in. So um, um, for me, I don't know for how long uh, the project is still going ongoing. You know, uh, so that that's the that's the process I have. You know, I can share with you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks for what. Uh, and lastly, we have Pedro. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking the dilemma of having to, uh, that uh, Fuat just spelled out, the dilemma of having to choose between Enrique and Panglima Awang. I, I cannot help but notice that your documentary opened and closed with an interview with the late Professor Fuke Kim. Uh, of course, he's a renowned historian from Malaysia. But in the closing words of Professor Ku in your trailer, he names the first person who circumnavigate the world as Panglima Awang, the eponymous hero of uh, the 1958 novel by Harun Amin uh, Rashid, right? Uh, so it is, I think, uh, quite a peculiar moment where a historian turns to the speculative and the fictional and the imagination to challenge uh, what would be a Eurocentric narrative of history for which he, he is a trained disciple of. So what do you make of this, uh, what was being said by uh, Prof. Ku, the late Prof. Prof. Ku. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, if you believe strongly that Henry arrived to Malacca, uh, well, I'm not, uh, of course, if you believe, it, for me, it's fine. Uh, some people believe that if he arrived, some don't have the, 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 the old facts that we can say that is true. Uh, but during the process of doing the, the, the documentary, and because it's a documentary, um, uh, one thing I, I'm trying to do, and I do this way because of this, I see even in Portugal and in Malay, a certain confusion. In Malaysia, also a certain confusion between the Pagdima One book and the true story that came on, on, the, on the book of, um, of uh, Pigafetta. So, so I was worried 
that confu that that um, that fact uh, confuse uh, people's mind. And um, even in Malaysia, uh, I have I visited Malaysia many many times. As as, as I told you yesterday, uh, I, I make many documentaries about the Portuguese settlement in, in in Malacca, and I was aware that the people in Malaysia did not heard much about the of Malacca. In Portugal, the same. Even Magellan in Malaysia, Singapore, is a name that don't say anything to, to people. Uh, in Portugal, area, area of Malacca, the same. Uh, most of the, my friends, uh, even, even uh, some colleagues, artists, area of Malacca, don't say nothing. So my first uh, concern when I did the documentary is at least give me uh, the chance to open a window uh, uh, about the knowledge that nowadays we have, the facts that nowadays we have, and in a certain way, uh, try to uh, give inf right information to, to the people. Information, when I say right, what we have nowadays, main source, the book of, of, of Pigafetta. So this is my first concern. Uh, give some information, try to the people learn what was the expedition? What was the relation between Magellan and area of Malacca? Uh, the way uh, 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 um, uh, Magellan say on his will that uh, Henry is a, a native from, 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 from Malacca. And to achieve this, I follow two, two, two ways. Uh, the documentary style with interviews to find, uh, to try to research, talk with uh, teachers and historians, uh, go to the places, and this, this, this documentary took me to many places like Argentina, Chile, the Strait of Magellan, Philippines. I was shooting in, in Cebu with a, a very nice crew in, 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 in Cebu. Uh, at, at the same time, I also tried to create some fiction, fictional scenes. Okay, as you see on the, on the trailer, we have the, 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 the interviews, but we have some scenes on the, on the, the, the main points of this whole. Uh, history about uh, Magellan and, and Henry. Of course, when I finish the documentary and go to so many places like San Julian, San Julian in Argentina, where the crew stopped for five months, when we have so many problems with Portuguese and Spanish and Magellan, and you know some punishments, very hard punishments that Magellan did for, for the for the Spanish that trying to 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 betray him. And when I finished the documentary, I want to give the step, okay, I did the documentary, now I want to do the movie. But of course, this is more complex uh, for we do a movie about the, the old story, even a movie about the point of view of Henry, something that is, is on my mind for two or three years, instead of a movie about the, the, the old trip of Magellan on the point of view of Magellan, why don't do a movie on the point of view of the Henry? No, the kid that of the 15 years old see the white man conquer the town, then pick up by the white man, go to Portugal, learn Portuguese, learn Spain, met the king of Spain, and then starting a big journey. How all, all, all the all, all his highs as a Malay or a Filipino uh, uh, see the whole complex uh, 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 trip and the fighting between the Portuguese and, and the Spanish is also is is on my mind. So if one day I can do a movie like that, it will be wonderful. But as I, as I told you, um, people have different opinions, of course. Maybe the Malay side, they want to believe it and they want that the area of Malacca uh, return to Malacca. It's possible, okay? It's possible. If, if it was see in, in Borneo, also is not a true fact, but someone said, a, a crew member said that see someone similar to the to do airing in Borneo. Maybe from Borneo is easy. You take a boat and back to, to, to Malacca. Even my friends from Malacca, usually they say that all the Malaccans love to back home. They don't, they, they don't like to stay outside Malaysia. In the end, all went back to, to, to Malaysia. So it's, it's possible. So regarding to the, your first question about the pro Professor Ko, well, is his opinion for me is fine. I also believe uh, that probably he, he can he return to, to Malacca, but it's just a big possibility. Okay. I don't want to dwell too much on you know what is historically verifiable or not, and maybe to use the remaining time, uh, perhaps we could dwell a bit on a comment made by an audience member. This is from Ninot Aziz, uh, who wrote on YouTube. And I'll read out her comments. 
uh, Enrique, aka Panglima Awang, inspired my young adult fiction, Nick and the Secrets of the Sunset Ship. Enrique was larger than life, and we can continue to enjoy inspiration and aspiration from his life and journey. The middle path is not always the best solution. Uh, Enrique of Malacca was a product of the New Santara. At the same time, Malacca represented through, throughout Sinanjong, Singapura, and Sultan Mahmud was in Kampa. There was no Malaysia, no Indonesia, and no Philippines. There was the Malay archipelago. All countries can today embrace his legacy together. Would any of our panelists like to respond to what Limot Aziz has shared with us? Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we will get into the same problem of academic jousting if, if all our panelists now would fight. Who is, is from our island, from our peninsula, from our, you know, I think that's why I, I feel the significance of being able to talk about this 500 years later is that, hey, it is possible that somebody from this general area uh, I, I use the word Austronesian because that's somehow something that's current but it's 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 a broad uh, acceptance that maybe that version of history that has been perpetuated by history books and the archives of Sevilla and whatever has been maybe even made permanent by the Gutenberg press, you know, uh, we all continue to believe this story. So if, if we are here, even talking about this, we have at least a common ground that from this Austronesian area, or specifically the South Seas of around in Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines, I would be very proud to feel that, hey, <laughs> isa sa atin, one of us could have done that. And thanks to the anal recording by Pigafetta, we have, <laughs> we have other people like Stephen Schweig or um, the fellow who wrote the Edge of the Earth acknowledging that maybe this lowly slave could have been the first person and not the big pompous conquistadors that we have been so used to, the superheroes that are always in our screens, in, in our history screens. So please, I think we let, let us let Enrique be larger than life, even if we don't have the opposites and loxits, you know, opposites and loxits, <laughs> our footnotes, opposite and loxite to cite but we know that from also oral traditions that maybe he is uh, that seafarer who blazed the trail that, and showed that the world was round. Mabuhay, Enrique. Hi. Yeah. Yes, uh, Paul, uh, Paulo Pinto, would you like to um, ask a question to our panelists? Yes, uh, thank you. It's not a question, it's just a very uh, quick remark because, you know, <clears throat> this is very interesting because I, I am an historian. And as an historian, we are always looking at the facts and the sources. And now to see this, uh, some, this character so important for, for our common history, seeing through the lens and the eyes of the artist, it's something. For me, very interesting, but very strange at the same time, because we are always focused on documents and so on. And that's, and just to say that um, <clears throat> I almost would like to say that, well, fortunately, we don't have sources about Henry, <laughs> because, because we don't have sources, we don't know exactly what happened to him. If he returned to his homeland, we don't know where his homeland was. That's exactly what allow us to give such a wide range of, of perspective. We can imagine, we can reinvent Henry the way as we would like to. 
without incurring into a heresy or contradicting documents, you know? And that's <clears throat> one of the riches of this uh, historical character, which has a, who has a, an historical side that I'm, me personally, focused on. At the same time, it, it is very interesting and motivating because precisely because we don't have sources, it allows us to be some sort of an universal character that otherwise wouldn't be possible. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you so much for sharing. And uh, uh, Paulo, I wonder if I could uh, lean on you uh, to perhaps help answer a question or more like a statement that just came in uh, by Emmy uh, Shafiza. She says that Enrique should not be portrayed to please current political entity, but need to be looked into, but what needs to be looked into are the real tribes of Enrique, who she believes he is of Kunlun tribe, sea people who were the masters of the sea. Uh, as I understand it, Kunlun is a, a, a Chinese term that's used to describe people in the South of people in Africa. So I'm, I'm not so sure about the historical context and therefore I'm not able to answer uh, uh, this statement. I wonder if you are able to help us unpacked it a bit. Where is the comment, sorry? Uh, I can, I'll write it in the chat box. Sorry, I'll share it in the chat box. I... Well, I, 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 I'm not, well, I don't have, any information about this. Uh, uh, well, of course, anyone can believe he's from a Kunlun tribe or well, or not. <laughs> uh, 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 yes. uh, we are we are uh, we are open to suggestions. So of course, it's <laughs> possible, it's plausible. But uh, what we I know, and we know what sources say, and so it's it's more or less uh, common knowledge of what could be his 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 origin from, from Sumatra. Just a, an historical detail, when we say that he was native from Malacca, some historians say and accurately, because Malacca at that time was not a city, it was a sultanate that dominated both sides of the strait. And so being native from Malacca, he, he could be from Sumatra because parts of Sumatra were under the sovereignty as, uh, of Malacca and sultanate. And so it, this is not, black and white perspective. But about the disconnect, well, I'm, I'm unable to comment, uh, but I agree that uh, he should not be portrayed to please the current political entity. Actually, he may be used and be portrayed as we would like to be. And it's natural that political entities would like to present him in favorable uh, colors for, uh, and so we can, uh, it's natural that the, the Philippines or Malaysia or the Indonesian claim the, this uh, figure, this, this, this character of, of, of Enrique as their own. And, and, and uh, well, it's, pol it's politics, but uh, uh, we, we are as historians and you and you as artists have the, the duty to, to present other perspectives, you know? <laughs> uh, that's my, my opinion, thank you. What about, uh, yeah. uh, I wanted to point out, similar to the argument about Magellan, you know, was he representing Spain, Portugal? Uh, I, you know, I got the sense that there's been a lot of debate between Spain and Portugal as to how to acknowledge Magellan or Magallanes. I mean, I certainly would like to hear from Pedro and uh, Paulo about, you know, this maybe competition between how Magellan is seen. That is a long, long story. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, long story <laughs> with, uh, with some friction, you see, between Portugal and, and Spain. And, uh, and of course, Paulo after they can, can put more, more information about it. But as I told you before, uh, in terms of um, information about these two characters, even in Portugal, maybe by maybe by political reasons, 
the, the figure of Magellan is put a bit aside. In a certain way, maybe before the Portuguese uh, feel a bit betrayed by, 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 by Magellan, because uh, uh, from Portugal he moved to Spain, he presented his project to the, to the king of Spain, and the Spain sponsored uh, the, the, his, his journey uh, uh, to the other side. So, and of course, in the past, some, uh, some uh, historians or some uh, governmental uh, put a, a bit this figure, this, uh, this captain, uh, a bit uh, uh, aside. Uh, in a certain way, when I digging about this, this process doing the, the documentary, I understand some motivation of, 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 of Magellan. Uh, we don't know if it's true, if he, if he present his project to the King of Portugal or not. Maybe he talk about it and the, and the King of Portugal say no. Uh, we cannot forget that during many times Magellan uh, tried to, to have a, a better compensation by the service that he, he did in the service of Portugal. And uh, most of the times the King refused his compensation. So we don't know what happened on the meeting if he go there and try once more give more compensation and maybe uh, be a higher rank and, and in a certain way present the project. Uh, but um, but I, 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 uh, the way I see Portugal for these 500 year, years, uh, uh, history, uh, years of, of history, um, I believe that Magellan in a certain way, he feel frustrated in Portugal, okay? And move to, to the other side. Of course, this creates some problems even between the King of Spain and the King of, of Portugal. Uh, someone, uh, someone say that the, even the King of Portugal, Dom Manuel, tried to catch Magellan after he leave Spain in, in uh, okay. Um, but uh, yes, uh, uh, and in, in a certain way, this create a shadow during these years about, uh, uh, about uh, Magellan and, and these motivations. But of course, I think Paulo is maybe the person that can put more information about this, this conflict between Portugal, Spain, Magellan and, uh, and, this, and this journey. No, it's an old, it's an old story. There's no need to, to, just, to, to just dig in this. Well, we got Portugal and Spain. Spain was uh, at that time, uh, well, uh, uh, a, a huge power in Portugal, a small country and that took advance in the voyages of exploring and, and reached Asia, so and so and so. And so. Uh, what I would like to say, uh, uh, one just one detail about Magellan, that some, sometimes people ask about, well, why Magellan did go to Spain? Did he betray or not his king? Well, this it doesn't, doesn't, it didn't make much sense, this sort of ideas in the 16th century. It was usual for the Portuguese noblemen that felt that they were not rewarded by the Portuguese king to just go to Spain and put their, in, and to put under uh, the, 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 the service of the king of Spain. It, it was something common between Portuguese fidalgos, Portuguese noblemen, uh, that didn't feel rewarded, and, and and from the other side, more or less the same. And so, it, uh, we don't know exactly what happened to Magellan because Magellan was one among other people that uh, sailed and went to Asia. But well, he actually uh, then became much more important that, than he was before. And now we are trying to dig in the documents why and why and why, but, but there's no real mystery. We, we don't have to speculate too much about this. But well, my personal feeling about this is, uh, well, we are now uh, in the 500 years and so and so of, of the voyage and Magellan and Portugal and Spain, Portugal and mostly Spain have their own official celebrations. Okay, but I, I'm a little bit tired of this old, you know, Magellan, yes, there are documents, there are lots of books. That, that's why I, I, I thought, and I think it's so interesting this, this way. That's why I collaborated with Pedro in the documentary because it, 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 it's showing the, the most famous uh, and first uh, sailor around the world uh, through the eyes of an Asian, uh, through the eyes of, through another perspective. And that, and that I think it's very interesting. And something new. Well, I'm a little bit tired of, of, of seeing all of these stories through the same perspective. 
Uh, sorry if I didn't give you any information about Portugal and Spain, but 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 I think I think it, it's time for us to move on to other perspective because uh, um, when even now the historians know that one of the most interesting ways for us to understand the past is see, seeing the past through the uh, several perspectives and lenses because it gives us a much more rich uh, 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 picture, whole picture of the, of the problem. Thank you. So um, I really hate to be the party pooper when the conversation is only starting to heat up and get so interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time tonight. Uh, so allow me to wrap up today's discussion by sharing a closing reflection. It's a note that uh, Kidlat earlier have shared with an audience member, Antonio, uh, who shared it on our chat box. And here I like to share it again with everyone as a way to end our discussion. So from Kidlat, others are free. They have creative and poetic license to produce artistic expressions of the human condition. No historian worth his craft should scoff at artistic creations. In some ways, the historian needs a bit of the courage of the artist to expand his horizons of understanding. But I think on that note, I feel there really is a case to be made uh, for putting together a future panel that actually brings historians and artists together in a conversation. Uh, uh, I think that will be a very fruitful our conversation uh, as evidenced by uh, all of Pinto's generous participation in our conversation just now. So in closing, what is left for me to do is really to just thank our audiences for attending today's discussion and a big thank you to our panelists, Pedro, Fuad, Lewis, and Kidlat for being so generous with your time. It was a real pleasure learning from all of you. I'd like to also thank Noel and Nikki for bringing all of us here together to, 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 thumbe, to thumbe over Zoom. And a big thank you to the organizing committee of this highly pertinent conference for doing an excellent job in moving ideas across borders of nations and languages. Um, have a good evening and a wonderful weekend. Stay safe, everyone. And please get yourself vaccinated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye bye, Simon. Thank you very much. Hope you see you. Hope you see everybody in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, as soon as possible.